Thanks, Taylor. Hey, Pine Cove, let's go. Love you guys. Man, love Pine Cove. Um, so grateful. It's going to be a great, great week. And happy Father's Day to everyone. It's good to see you. Hope you do get outside, uh, put a little bit better than I did. But um, today we're going to talk about Jesus, uh, the better leader. You can go ahead and turn to uh, the book of Hebrews, all right? Everybody grab your Bible and look at the, the we're going to be in the third chapter ultimately um, as we're in this series. We've called it Better, and today we're going to talk about how Jesus is the better leader. Uh, it was way back, 1688, during what was called the Glorious Revolution in England, um, when uh, James Francis Stewart was among many who were claiming that they were the ones to ascend the throne and be the leaders. It was a wild time, different families, lineages, lines, all the things. Um, and it was Queen Anne then later addressing Parliament. And she, she said this, she said, from Dunkirk, the ship left and the pretender was on board, referencing him. And that stuck. So he became, he's now known as the old pretender. Um, and now anyone, it's a term that was, that was used for anyone who would seek to be, uh, you know, at, at, the, at the height of leadership or the rightful heir, anyone who claims to be the legitimate uh, leader, posturing for leadership, pretending to be the leader. And today we're going to talk about there's a lot of pretenders that are seeking to take on the throne of your life as a leader. The question I'm going to ask you is who's your leader? Really? Who's your leader? Because we've got a lot of people. Again, we got people in our culture, you know, claiming to be the leader, right? I mean, we see it in a democracy, we see it, politicians claiming to be the rightful leader or not, to be the legitimate leader or those in charge are not legitimate. Maybe at your workplace, like, okay, on the org chart, you claim to be a leader, you're not a leader or someone who rises up thinking they are, maybe on a team or whatever else. And you've seen it, kind of power plays, right? It's like, uh, gosh, we see it in the culture. I mean, LeBron claiming to be the goat when we all know Jordan's the goat. Um, things like that. I mean, we just see it where people are ta- trying to take on, you know, claiming their rightful place. And the writer of Hebrews is going to say, as he said, okay, we started in chapter one where he says, hey, Jesus is a better guide. He, he's, the better, he's better than, than prophets. He's better than anyone who's come along. He's better than angels because he's not just a messenger. He is the message. And then he says in chapter two, he's invited us then into a better family. And here we're going to see that Jesus is the better leader. And we're going to see three things in this passage that I want you, if you take notes on sermons, I know I'm a, my Pineco people are. Um, he, he's the best leader because he's loyal. Okay, that would be like an understatement. He's faithful. He's the lead architect. And ultimately, he's Lord. And so what I want to do is read the text. You've got your Bible with you. Um, and I just want you to listen to it. Then we'll unpack it as we do uh, every week. All right? Chapter 3, Hebrews 3. Follow along with me. Therefore, and this is like the second, third, therefore. We're going to see him throughout. Hebrew. He's saying, okay, all that's been said up to this point. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to things that were to be spoken later. But Christ, literally, Messiah, is faithful over God's house as son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in hope. Okay, so first thing I want you to see is that he is loyal. He is loyal. Check it out. Therefore, again, holy brothers. Now I want to stop here for a sec. Uh, We had a lot that's been spinning around in the news uh, this week. This word here is literally brothers. Uh, Now, it's the male plural. We need to see that. Oftentimes we read scripture and, it, and, and like if you're like a woman or a girl here, brother. Okay, what about sisters? What about us, right? And oftentimes we can kind of lean that way. Well, he's just talking to men, I guess. Like men, because men are leaders and men are to, to no, no. It's, it's, the, it's the masculine 
plural. And here's the thing I want you to see. As you read scripture, and where you see it says brothers, um, sometimes it's translated brothers and sisters, but this is literally and often brothers, holy, set apart brothers, all of us. And then when you see the word son, often, like, and it says sons and daughters often, but here's the thing. This is a radical shift. Jesus came, you know this, he turned cultural norms of males and females upside down. Roles even to say, hey, everybody is in the family of God and at the foot of the cross, everyone is equal. And this past week, we heard some of the craziness going on at the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, you may not follow all that, but they doubled down, the leaders and gosh, the messengers, double down to say, okay, women can only hold certain roles and positions um, in, in the church. And, and, and here, I just want to pause and say this. If you're guests, some of you are new here today. We are here to empower and equip all men and women, boys and girls. Jesus did not genderize the Great Commission. Jesus, and look at this, when he doles out gifts in Ephesians 4, in, in 1 Corinthians, other places... He did not, God does not dispense his gifts according to, to whether you're male or female. We know that the sons and daughters will prophesy, as it says in Job. We see this in Acts when it's talking about Pentecost. What's going on here? Everyone is being raised up. It's why Paul says in Galatians 3, there is no Jew nor Greek nor, well, look at this, slave nor master, slave nor free, and there's no male or female. Now, he's not saying that there's not male, male, female distinctions, binary distinctions of the sexes. What he is saying is he's making cultural comparison there, contrasting cultural comparisons to say, this is exactly what he's saying, in Christ, that's literally, in Christ, we are all the same, equal at the foot of the cross. Now, do we have different you know, roles or places where we serve? You know, here's the thing, we, and today we're going to talk about dads, okay, being leaders, we need more dads to step up as leaders. But women are leaders as well. I mean, you could argue, you think about your own home. It's the way we define leadership, I think. Oftentimes, mom is the leader in the home, frankly. And by the way, Jesus, the most powerful man in the room, shows us what a leader does, and he gets on his knees and he washes the disciples' feet. I know this, going to places like Guatemala, been to Africa, been all over the world, go to South America, go to the Middle East, go all over the world, even in patriarchal societies, much more than ours. What we see are women raised up to serve, and that's what we're doing here. Girls raising up to see women and, and others leading in the church, and we need to do more. We need to double down. And now we need to say, no, 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 we're going to be the church it says we're going to raise up others. Now, we, we say it this way. Our tribe, okay, is the Texas Baptist. It's our state convention. If y'all don't know anything about Baptist, what's up? We need to learn more. In, in fact, we do implicitly um, without you knowing it. We're always talking about what are our distinctives as, as believers first, okay? But we need to hear again, there, there are no, there, there's no hierarchy in the body of Christ that always leads to some craziness. If you want to learn more, and let me challenge you to do this. Um, I've, I've, I've spoken into this a lot through the years. Uh, we're going to do so as we move forward here, but uh, you can go to our website. You can see it there, pcbc.org slash women's roles. I want you to go there, learn more, please learn, be educated. Okay. You can find also a sermon there that I've preached sometime back on this whole issue, even my journey, um, through the years. Okay. So look at this. The writer says we, we all share in this heavenly, okay, higher now future calling. But here's what he says. I want you to catch this. He says, consider, okay, consider, look at. Now, this is, this is important. It's why, you know, you often hear a pastor or someone say, well, the Greek says, you know, and you're like, didn't it, isn't it translated here? Like, why, what? Because Greek was the most highly inflected, most definitive language ever in history, God chooses it to write the New Testament. And here we have this prefix, it's kata in the Greek, which means um, down or into. This is saying, okay, look at, go all the way thoroughly, distinctively, definitively into this. We would say this, get to the bottom of it. Let's get to the bottom of this. This is not just, yeah, think about Jesus. In fact, it has, it has a reflective property. 
to it as well. So, and this is a good word. Look at Jesus, consider him, look at him, and let him look at you. Like I've often said it this way. Stop trying to be like him. Behold him. Just look at him. And that's what we're always trying to do in our worship. And even through our preaching, you'll see it today. That's what the writer's doing. Look at Jesus. Consider Jesus. So we look at, this is how we read God's word. When we're going through our dwell reading plan, you read God's word. You look at God's word. You let it look at you. That's what's going on here. How is my life impacted by what I'm reading? Let the Bible read you. And then decide, whew, somebody's going to win out here. I'm going to let God's word win out in my life. Okay, pause there because that's really important what he's saying. Look intently at Jesus. Look at him. He's going to say it throughout. But even here, what does this look like? What are we looking at? Did you catch it? What are we looking at? We're looking at his beard? What are we looking at? Look at his robe? What are, what are we looking at here? Two things, two roles. He has been faithful. He's loyal in two roles specifically. Do you see him? What are they? Apostle and what? Y'all can help me out a little bit, my Pineco friend. Apostle and high priest, right? Apostle and high priest. Now, I want to pause here because this is so important. And then applications to dads, if you're tracking with me, moms as well, anybody who's in leadership. Leadership is influence. And so when, when we look at him as apostle and priest, apostle literally means sent one. Okay, so you're sent by someone else. You've heard that word before, apostle. It's being used here as Jesus. He's a sent by God, right? He sent, watch this, Moses was also sent. Moses was faithful, as he notes. Um, but Jesus comes from God, is God in the flesh. God among us, the incarnation. So he comes to us, and Jesus said this over and over again in his ministry. Like, I'm from the Father. Uh, I don't do anything but what the Father tells me to do. And so in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus begins his ministry, you, you know this passage, he's quoting from Isaiah. This is where the first time he almost got killed for, for saying, this is me. Okay, in Luke 4, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me, there it is, to proclaim freedom to to prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to the oppressed, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So in that sense, Jesus is an apostle. The only place he's called an apostle, by the way, in the New Testament or anywhere. And he represents God among us. But look at this. He's also the high priest. Don't miss this. He's from God, representing God to us. And now he's representing us to God, Right? So the writer's going to say, Moses, okay, give him props, but Moses represents the law. The law shows us who God is and how holy he is and shows us, as, as uh, Paul writes in Galatians 3, other play, Romans, other places, the law shows that we can't do it. And you're like, well, that's kind of a dirty trick. No, he's showing us we can't live up to his holy standards. The law only reveals our sin. I've said it this way. It's like having a bad hair day or a bad hair life. And, and you wake up and you go, man, my hair's looking bad today. Um, and I got to fix this thing. You, the mirror shows you your hair's looking bad, but you don't pull the mirror off of the wall and go, dang, I got to fix this, this hair. It's not designed to fix your hair. The law shows your problem. It doesn't help you with the problem. The law shows you God's holiness. It does nothing to help you bridge the gap. And so Jesus comes, he serves both. You tracking with me here? So this is why he says he's an apostle and high priest. And look at this. This is our confession. This is our confession. This, this means what we affirm. It's what we've been taught. It's what we believe. He's the great leader. Jesus is the better leader because he's the one loyal to how and why God has sent him. Only in Jesus do we have heaven coming down to earth, earth coming back now in Christ back to heaven how do we live this out? Pause for a moment for application along the way, right? I want to challenge you. It's a word for our dads here. What, how do we live this confession out? First, you receive it by faith. Not by works of the law, by trying to be good enough, but by faith for the finished work that Christ has already accomplished. But here's the other part of this. Have you confessed your faith? Have you proclaimed your faith? Like, like we, we've had baptisms recently. We'll have more next week when we say, okay, what is your profession of faith? You're professing the confession. 
your belief out loud and in person in front of everyone. I want to ask you, have you been baptized? Not as a legalistic thing to jump through. It's not salvific. It's not going to get you to heaven. But watch this. I've talked to so many people who have que- who question their salvation, question the assurance of their salvation, and don't live in the power of the Spirit, I believe in large part because they've never proclaimed their faith publicly to others through baptism. Again, not a magic thing, but it is a big deal. If you've never been baptized, follow the question. Why not? Why not? You proclaim your faith, proclaim your confession because it drives a stake in the ground and says, I am with him. I have died to myself. What's this? The cruciform life. I'm raised, I'm totally forgiven. I'm coming out now to live totally for him. That's my confession. He is, here it is, Lord of my life. He is leader of my life. Often I talk to children about what Lord means. It means he's your leader. And he's the only leader that you're going to follow. Of all those who seek to pretend to be leaders, who seek to ascend to the throne of your heart, of your life, Jesus is better. Dad, this is a word for you. Have you been baptized? If not, why not? Lead the way, Dad. Moms, do the same. Jesus is anointed. He's sent from the Father. Listen, I would say this. Jesus is a man under authority. Dads are under authority. Moms are under authority. We're all under the authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. So if he has all authority, how much do we have? None. So we live under his authority as Lord of our lives, and we go to change the world and live for him under his power, right? But here's the thing, dad, you are under the authority of God. And let me ask you this, what greater role could you ever have than to be God's representative to your family and then to come before God on their behalf? That's the role of a father. You're sent, you're a priest in your home. And how do we do this? Well, we all know of the transference of father to capital F Father. And it's why today is a challenging day for some of us. But let's come clean, all of us, mass confession, none of us have perfect fathers. We got one, and none of us are perfect fathers. My prayer this morning has been, and throughout the day, that dads, you won't feel beat down today. We want you to be raised up, encouraged. I'm gonna challenge you, but I want you to be encouraged How do you be a good father? How can you be a good father? You run to the father and his love, knowing that Jesus represents you to him and and he has come for you. I'd say this, how can you be the best father possibly or possible in your life and in your family? Always a two word um, challenge on Father's Day. Be there, be there. You You can't father from a distance. Uh, see, error increases with distance. And, and, and to be present, gang, listen, we talk about this a lot here. Attention is the beginning of devotion. Focus is the beginning of impact and influence and love. Jesus focused in on whomever God put in front of him, the Father put in front of whatever came about. And here, this is true for you. Dads, listen, when you're present, be present. Not on your phone, watching the game. Be present. Come down close, even as Jesus did for us. How can you be an apostle? Here it is. Follow the way of Jesus. Proclaim good news to them. Proclaim good news to your children. When they mess up, there's forgiveness. Give them liberty. Set them free from the things that put them in bondage. Whether it's a poor body image or lack of confidence or a pull towards addictive behavior or performance or the approval of others, help them recover sight. Let them see the love of Christ in you. Show them the glory of God in creation and through kindness and love that dominates the home. Set them free from oppression and teach them to war against the oppressor. Teach them to to see the the, the temptations that come their way. Help them overcome those things. And again, help them overcome cultural expectations. 
for, for men and for women, for boys and girls. Give them a safe place and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor on their lives. Pray for them. Love them without condition. Your home is a safe place in a world that doesn't always seem secure and safe. Be a priest for them. Pray for them and with them. Listen, dads, parents, how do you teach a kid to pray? How do we all learn to pray? By praying with someone else. Pray with your children. If you want your kids to, 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 be, to graduate ultimately or be sent off, and if you don't send them off, you failed. But when you send them off, then you want them to follow the Lord when you're not around. Teach them to pray. How? Pray with them. You want them to know God's word. Are you in his word? Do they know that you're in the word? And again, the dwell reading plan is a perfect thing to do for kids who are older who can read. Read together. Talk about it. Like the scriptures tell us, even Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema. Talk about it when you sit down. Talk about it when you rise up. Talk about it when you go to bed. And listen, the best thing you can do, dads, for your kids, love their mom. That's it. It's why in Ephesians 5, Paul says that the men are to die for their wives, to die to themselves. He says, out of reverence for Christ, we often get this wrong, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's mutual submission in the home. So kids get a front row seat to this gospel reenactment in the home. Dad dying to himself. Mom doing the same, being like Jesus, right? We often talk about servant leadership, particularly as men and Father's Day, or whatever, and we leave off the servant piece. Do your kids see you serving mom? Showing respect to her, showing respect to them. You want respect, but are you giving respect? You see, Jesus is the one who shows the way. He's the apostle. He's priest, and he's called us to do the same. Even among our friends, single adults and young people, we can do this. We can be loyal as he is. So he's loyal. Watch this. Secondly, he's, he's the leader. He's the lead architect. He's the one. Now the writer shifts to argue that Jesus is better than Moses. Look at verse 3. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now the analogy here starts to, wait, what? For every house is built by someone, but the builder of house, of, of all things, is God. Now, we read this and we go, well, of course he's better than Moses, right, in our context. Remember, these are Hebrews. They are Jews, have come to Christ under persecution in a global context, city context, and they're being challenged to go back to the law more than anything. Like, let's just go back. This is getting hard. And, and, and I talked to a rabbi not too many years ago. And I was saying, hey, tell me this. I'm curious. Does, where does Jesus come into play? I kind of knew what the answer was, but does he come into play at all, like in your theology? Or he said, he doesn't come in. He was kind, but in any way. Meaning, Jesus is irrelevant to me. Now, for the Jew, Moses was the one. We read it this week, didn't we? He's the one. He was chosen by God. He was amazing. He was, he, he was like a friend of God. He confronted Pharaoh, as we read this week in our reading plan. He led the people out of Egypt. He, he brought the law. Again, he was the goat, like by a long shot. He wrote most of the Old Testament. Moses was the man, but Moses was a sinner. We know that. Jesus was perfect. Moses delivered the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, lived it out, the very heart of the law. And so again, we go, well, of course he's greater. Moses was a member of the, of the household of God. Jesus is the owner of the house, of our house and of, of our house here in the global church. There are several applications here. First, you don't own anything. We need to be reminded of this. Everything you have is his. So I would to live, live generously because Jesus showed us that it is a privilege to steward all that we have. Are you stewarding well? Are you doing that well? And secondly, it means that we need to give ourselves to being, watch this, Dad, a part of the house that we're in. We're not Jesus. 
I mean, we're not, we're not Lord of all. And sometimes dads step in like, well, I'm the breadwinner. I'm the leader of the house. I'm the, I'm the man of the house. In fact, and we think then we are somehow above the values, the rules, the guidance that we're seeking in the home. You're the one who sets the values in the home along with your wife, not the kids. But th- here's what this means. You're telling your kids you desire for them to be sexually pure. Are you? Again, you want your kids off their phones, older kids. Are you off your phone and your screens? You want, again, you want them in the word. Are you in the word? You want them to show respect to you. Are you showing them respect? Are you showing respect to their mom or dad the other way around? Are you frustrated by their poor financial decisions when you're not stewarding what God's given you? And I, I just need to say this. Are you a giver? This is not that, just that pastor moment. I'm telling you, friends, regular giving and generous giving, giving to a point where you go, everything belongs to God, and I'm going to give to him first. Are you modeling that for your kids? Because if you don't, finances, money, all the th- jobs will take the throne of your life and of their life. In fact, it may be the very throne, on the throne of your life, driving everything. And I want to say this pragmatically. Um, as a practical guide here, challenge. The end of our fiscal year, it ends July, June 30th. And we are significantly behind right now. And I praise God for the generosity that we, we all have shown throughout the year. But if, I just want to challenge you now. If you can give now, really it's a critical time. Because if we don't finish the year strong, um, we, we, it'll impact ministry to come. And we're in a high cash intensive time with all of our trips, all of our, all of our gosh, outreach, sports camps, hundreds of kids in camps all summer long. And we need you to help us. We just got a team again, back from South Texas, more to go. We just finished funding an amazing VBS. All of this, listen, money and ministry always go together. Now, yes, at the heart of it all, we're just making disciples one person at a time. We just voted on a $13.1 million budget. You say that quick enough, sounds like not a lot of money, right? Um, but I'm telling you, it's going to take all of us, young people, children, every one of us. And I just want to encourage you, if you're able to give the unified budget right now, it would really set us free and not have, have us to hold back because that's what we're doing now with staff, saying we can't do that. You're not going to be able to do that. Uh, and we need to finish strong. So we give, yes, to fuel ministry, but we give primarily because foundationally, everything owns, uh, is owned by God. He's the lead architect, right? So dads, again, we must practice what we preach. Because if you, if you think you rise above the, the rules, all the things in the home, that's, that's hypocrisy is what that is. That's not leadership. You, you're not controlling. You're self-controlling. You, you show them the... The fruit of the spirit. And oftentimes, here's where we get some tension here. I know we have some single parents among us. We want you to know we're here for you and with you. We want to help you. But with parents, watch this, a father and a mother, oftentimes we lean, because all of us lean one way or the other. We lean towards grace or we lean towards truth. Jesus is perfect, right? Filled with grace and truth, not partial, full of grace and truth. And it takes both of us. That's where the communication is so critical together, Right? Because one would be all about grace, the other would be all about law. But we all tend to go legalistic on our kids and not parent with truth and grace. Because truth without grace is not truth. And grace without truth is not really grace. I've said it often. Rules without relationship breeds rebellion in a child. And that's where some of us are really tenderhearted today. With our own fathers, perhaps. You can't lead If you're not there and close in, why would you turn back to the law is what the writer is saying. If Jesus is better than Moses, the gospel is better than the law. And so look at this. It's it's in uh, John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see that? So the law, yes, way to go, Moses. You're the man. But Jesus is the one. And dads, we need to constantly point our kids to him. You're not the Lord of your house. He is. And that's what I want you to see now. He is a better leader because he is Lord. He's our Lord. He's the rightful 
Lord over all things. He's the legitimate king in your life among all the pretenders vying for obedience. Look at verse five. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Ah, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. There's that word again. We are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. He says, Moses was indeed faithful. He was loyal in his role, but he was a servant in the house. Jesus is the son in the house. Jesus is the heir of all things. And as we said last week, he invites us into his family as heirs and he, our older brother. What's going on here as we see throughout scripture, the Old Testament in particular, Moses is just a shadow. Jesus is the light. He's arguing, why would you go back from light into darkness? That's what it is to go back to the law, meaning constantly trying to justify yourself, trying to validate yourself before others and in your life and ultimately before God. You can't do it, he says. You cannot justify yourself. So Jesus comes, and so it's by faith, not by our works, we receive what he's already accomplished for us. But look at this. The Son is Lord over all, and it says, if we hold fast our confidence in him. Now, this sounds like he's saying, oh, Jesus is great. He's the goat. He's the one. He's the leader. But you better keep on persevering, or you're not going to make it. You're not going to be counted among those who are saved. That's not what he's saying. Our perseverance doesn't save us. Jesus saves us. Jesus' perseverance saves us. I would say it this way. Perseverance doesn't save you. Saved people persevere. You know, it it was John Calvin who said it, in essence. Works don't save us. Saved people will do the works of Jesus. It's evidence. It's proof. Now, do we do it perfectly? No. Do we constantly come back to him all the time? Look at this. So what are we persevering? Persevering in what? Look at the text. Our performance, work, living moral lives. No, he says, hold fast to our hope. You catch that? Don't miss this. What is our hope? Jesus, the gospel. Don't turn back to self-righteousness. Again, this is the great temptation, and it's all of us. The law is always our default. Legalism, works, is always the default. He's saying, don't go back to it. Keep pressing on, focus on Jesus, consider him, be furiously obsessed with Jesus and focus on him and his love for you. Watch this. It's not even your love for God that saves you. It's his love for you because he first loved you in Christ. Our hope is in Jesus, not in ourselves. It's why Paul says in Galatians 3, I love this. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing by faith, hearing with faith? Is a gift. Or are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, are you trying to let Moses finish what Jesus has started in you? Jesus is the faithful leader. He's the one that we pursue constantly. And in so doing, we become like him. It's always the case. So brothers and sisters, consider Jesus. This is the challenge of the writer of Hebrews and the word of God for you today. Don't give up. And dads, don't give up. You hear it often. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And when you fall down, and we all will, get back up. Keep pressing on. Don't give up. And the pressing on is to continue to pursue Jesus with all you've got, with all the competing time demands that you have as a father. And it's hard to be a father these days. It's hard. Jesus didn't talk about balance. He talked about the pursuit of one single thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will find its place. Jesus is worth it all. Don't return to religion because then you abandon Christ. He's called you to pursue him. And you may be here today and going, man, am I really saved? You can settle that today. And if you're like me, often I'm like, Lord, I'm saved. I'm sorry, I wish I was further along. I thought I'd be further along by now. Don't give up. And keep running to the grace of God. 
that is yours in Christ Jesus. Romans 14, 9, I'll close with this. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. We're gonna close our, our service in a special way today. We're gonna sing a song together of the Father's love. But dads, moms, young people, children, don't let any pretenders come after you or take the throne of your life. And there are a lot of them out there. And most often the pretenders, they seem like legitimate leaders. Let me ask you, what is it for you? What is most often uh, tempting, challenging you to take on the throne of your life, to be leader of your life? Because for some of us, it might, gosh, it might be your children. And I've said it before, you, you make them leaders of your home, you find identity in them, it'll crush you as you crush them to be all that you want them to be, and they're not gonna be. Maybe it's another person, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's the pursuit of those things. It's become a driver for you. Maybe it's your job, which is why you can't be there. Who's pointing a gun at your head? What's driving you? See, we've made a lot of pretenders the leaders of our lives.